Welcome to In the Works, Makers and Shakers. I'm Sarah Jean Colbreth, clothing and textile historian. I'd like to introduce you to Emily Adams Bodie, founder of Bodie, and Lacey Schutz, executive director of the Shaker Museum. Hi. Hi. So something that ties Shaker design to the work of creators like you, Emily, is a personal and communal expression of beauty. Shakers often incorporated playful and surprising elements into their clothing and textiles. Wonderful details that maybe only the wearer would know about, such as uh, fun printed cotton, but that was only used in the lining, or a brother's collar that was made of a sort of luxurious silk. And Lacey, I wanted to start by asking you, the impression is that Shakers live rigid, even severe lives. And I wanted to know, am, am I right in thinking that these personal expressions of creativity seem to show us otherwise? Yeah, I think, I think there's often uh, a tendency to think of the Shakers as sort of, you know, monolithic, but um, at the height, there were something like 6,000 Shakers spread across a number of different communities. And, um, you know, we're very familiar with the chair and the oval box and these things that were created in a kind of proto-industrial um, setting for for public consumption. But I, I don't have any impression that their their personal lives weren't full of um, fulfillment and joy. And I think that you're absolutely right. Um, sometimes you look at some of these um, pieces that were used by individuals, whether they were material culture items that were in their in their living spaces or were, were their actual um, attire. And you really do see these, these individual um, elements to the clothing. I think that the, the external idea was that um, you wanted to look as much like your fellow shaker as possible so that there was a sort of sense of um, uh, commonality and um, that everybody was equal. But, but there were these little, little um, touches of individualism here and there. And Emily, I feel like your clothes are the result of a similar perspective that the wearer feels intimately connected to the garment in a way that isn't, isn't always overt, right? So you can look at one of your, your jackets, for example, and it's beautiful and really striking and unique, but maybe only the wearer knows the provenance or that it's a log cabin quilt originally, or um, kind of has that more intimate knowledge of, of what the original textile was. And um, I wanted to ask, how does that personal connection of garment to wear drive your work? Yeah, so, so much of what we do is about that emotional connection. And I've always been interested in familial narratives and historical narratives. So if someone has a close relationship to something, chances are, you know, they'll, they'll tell us that, you know, maybe in our retail store, but a lot of times it, it really is a, an intimate relationship. So they might have had an experience with a quilt like this, you know, in their home growing up, or it might remind them of their grandmother's summertime tablecloths or, or things like that. And, and I'm, I'm definitely intrigued and inspired by that because I feel like it's my duty to help preserve some of these emotional responses that we have to objects and to clothing, but also to preserve the narrative and the technique behind them. And I think even, um, even more obviously, there's, there's this sort of common feeling of, of playfulness. I'm thinking of, for example, this, this Shaker table mat that's in the Shaker Museum collection that is, I think it's called the dollar mat because the little circles are roughly the size of what was a dollar then. And it's, it's very playful and tactile and has some movement. And that was a utilitarian object. It was something that you used when you were eating or, or something that they maybe sold um, in, in the stores that they had. And it reminds me so much, Emily, of your, uh, you have a jacket in your fall 2020 collection that has that same sort of movement and um, kind of, you know, these, these sort of circles that draw your eye up and down the jacket. And I think that 
uh, the Shakers are maybe not known for that. And I, I, I feel like that's something that um, when you're looking at, at for example, the, the catalog on the Shaker Museum, it sort of stands out as being really kind of more fun than you'd think. But I just feel like your work is sort of similar. It's, it has a playful feeling and mentality. That's no, great. thank you. I mean, so for that jacket in particular, um, I mean, that mat has always inspired me and I've always wanted to do that as a, as a jacket. And then, you know, the colors and tones from that mat definitely played into this collection and the circle. So the jacket you're talking about is it's made from, you know, crocheted yo-yos and it has a really beautiful history in that women, you know, as women were entering into the workforce more and more, yo-yos were a really beautiful way to be able to continue to craft throughout the day and not have to carry around, you know, a massive quilt with you. And so you could do little medallions and, you know, uh, you know, on the way to work, or maybe if you're doing something else. And, and that fits so beautifully into the Shaker narrative too. I, I was reading once that, you know, if someone was using their feet often for, you know, something in the kitchen or churning or, that often women would knit. So they were almost doing like two, you know, two practices at once. And, and I think that's a really beautiful way of thinking about craft that, you know, your, your hands are busy, but it's, I don't know, it's really nice. Hands to work, hearts to God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, that, that's actually a perfect um, sort of segue into something else that I was thinking about that I wanted to ask you both about that, um, Emily, I heard you describe a jacket once as you, you sort of said, you know, up until it came to me or came to us, there wasn't a machine stitch on this. And it was our use of the sewing machine that sort of made it into a utilitarian object. It could be worn now. And your clothes honor handcraft and the beauty of tradition, but I think you also understand that new technology can be embraced simultaneously and, and when needed. And um, how do you, I guess what I'm wondering is how do you balance the celebration of old textiles while growing as a company and embracing these new technologies? Right. Yeah, that's important because I mean, we do still offer quite a bit of hand embroidery and hand sewing, especially with our work that we do in India, um, you know, in terms of like kantha stitching and and cross stitching, but I don't know. I, I think that technological advances, especially in the world of knitting or, you know, maybe a specific craft technique has really allowed us to tell the narrative to a larger audience um, and to really dive deeper into a product that we want to celebrate or an idea that we want to celebrate. So, one item is the, you know, the yellow coverlet trousers. Uh, we did a couple of different styles in this fabrication this season. And the coverlet, uh, it's an overshot loom. And, and we reproduced this at a upholstery mill. So instead of doing this on a hand loom, we did it at an upholstery mill on a machine loom. And we were able to do, you know, a silk linen, <clears throat> um, base and then still have the wool design you know the geometric design and you know this this was in part so that we could have a more wearable item you know is a, a thinner uh material that really works well for men and you can do trousers and outerwear and suit jackets and um whatever but it's also it's quite durable you know the the idea of, you know, the rot or whatever won't happen so, mm -hmm. so much. And I don't know, that, that was one way that we use technology. And, and if you look at, you know, some of the shaker looms in the overshot looms, and you look at this piece, they, they have, they evoke the same pattern and, you know, the same idea. And so we can tell that narrative through this fabrication, even though it was used on, you know, on a machine. Right, and, and to tell it in a way that makes more sense with clothing because it's no longer just going to be on your bed, it's going to be on your body. So it needs right. to serve a different purpose. Right, 
Same, same with embroidery too. You know, sometimes it makes sense for us to do it as a machine embroidery uh, than by hand, you know, you know, maybe if it's on a trouser or where, wherever it might, might land on your clothing. And I think that that um, mentality of sort of taking advantage of technology is, is absolutely something that's central to the shaker way of life. I think um, they absolutely were open to incorporating machines and, and new inventions to make work faster and, and more effective. And I'm thinking of, you know, water turbines and sewing machines, certainly, and washing machines. That was something that the Shakers really invented their own washing machine to make that work um, faster and, and, and better, maybe. And I wanted to ask Lacey if, if, you, if you could speak to the Shaker's impulse to take advantage of these time-saving technologies and, and how did that pragmatism kind of reflect or fit into their ethos of, um, of, of work, I guess? Yeah, well, you, you mentioned um, uh, hands to work and hearts to God. And I think that's such a lovely um, phrase that sums up the fact that the Shakers really believed that all of their labor was part of their their worship. So no matter what they were doing, um, they were sort of uh, exalting God in 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 those activities. Um, and and it's true the Shakers the Shakers loved technology. <laughs> um, they weren't like some other you know you think of some some sort of um, religious communities that that are um, or were very. Um, uh, tradition bound. Uh, the Shakers, they stayed on top of technology. They subscribed to all of the sort of journals that talked about new ways of um, uh, land management and agriculture and things like that. And they would, they would often, they were very, always very eager to, to obtain the newest technology. And they often um, uh, expanded on it and improved it and made it work in these sort of larger, larger communal settings. Um, but I think too, I mean, not, it's not just that their labor was um, part of their worship and that they were pragmatists, but they were also perfectionists. And I think that's a term that gets a little bit misunderstood in the context of the Shakers sometimes because it makes you think, oh, they just needed everything to be at right angles on their desk. But um, the truth is that in, in perfectionism, from a religious standpoint, there's this idea that um, that if you perfect the world around you, you actually create a heaven on earth. Um, so it's not just that everything needs to be in its place, it's that you actually create this, um, this other world by, by improving upon the things around you, which I think is a really lovely, um, inspiring way to think about uh, the work that we do. And I think that, that any craftsperson understands that frustration of not having the right tool for the job and and what's sort of the point of, of not using the best um, technology available to you what what's the point of, of working harder than you have to to create the same good and I think especially with the shakers who who did have to produce to sell um, objects and, and I'm thinking not just seeds but also um, you know, cloaks and, and textile objects so that that income could, could support these new technologies that they needed to, um, to live. And I, I think almost without these new technologies, how could they have done that really in any, in any sort of sustainable way? But yeah, it's, I think most people don't think about that unless, unless you've spent some time studying shakers, you think of most people think of them as sort of being like Amish, where they don't pick these new, they don't take these new new inventions seriously. A collaborative and supportive community is central to the Shaker way of life. Shaker sisters would help and teach one another. They might travel to nearby communities to teach other believers how to knit socks, for example, or a sister might help someone fit a dress in exchange for some help working on weaving a rug. And I think that so much textile work really requires and benefits from the help of others. Lacey, have there, there have been obviously other communities um, and both religious and sort of ascetic communities, but what was it about the Shakers that made them, that made them so innovative and inventive? And was that the result of working together in, in collaboration, do you think? 
I think that I think the Shakers were such an interesting group, um, and I think it's interesting that they they emerged really at the dawn of the United States. Um, they came over here in the late 1700s, and they had such a radical um, view of gender. Uh, they they were founded by a woman, and they allowed um, they allowed women to be full participants in their communities. And they did that. They really did that through through the celibacy, which I think a lot of people don't understand that um, in an era before um, before any kind of birth control was really available, it would have been very hard for a woman to get an education, start a business, um, you know, spend time thinking and writing and lecturing and, and things like that and pursuing craft. Um, and I think that actually the fact that um, they didn't marginalize half of their <laughs> half of their constituency that all all of the people men and women were actively involved in um, making the communities better is one of the things that makes them so extraordinary and gave them this incredible energy to um, to innovate and invent and um, make all of these beautiful objects mm -hmm. I'd like to, we'll come back to um, to the women's role in, in the Shaker community because I think that that's really so interesting. But I wanted to ask you first, Emily, um, when I think when I think of your studio, I sort of think of a workshop or almost like a sewing circle. Uh, every time I visited, there's, you know, there's one person sewing buttons next to a person who's mending and then um, everyone's sort of laughing and talking while working. And how, how important is this is this community and, and sort of collaboration to to your work? Gosh, I think it makes the work. You know, I I've always said, you know, since I first launched the brand, I've always wanted to have a studio and atelier. You know, I wanted to invest really early on in our own manufacturing. I think that you get so much from having multiple hands touch the product and from having you know, even your buttons sewn on by hand. And, and you really, you feel that in the clothing. And especially as we work to, you know, preserve a lot of these textiles or techniques, but also extend the product life cycle, having people who are really, um, really good at mending or darning uh, in my own business and as, you know, having full-time jobs just mending is really valuable and really important. Definitely. I think it shows. I mean, every, it's, it's sort of this, this like holistic idea of, of looking at a garment and seeing, and seeing all these different hands that touched it, but also seeing that everything has been done to sort of the, the highest degree where mending is just as important as sewing and everything is um, kind of essential, I guess. But um, so back to, back to, the, to sisters. Um, as a textile historian, I see clearly throughout history that creating and maintaining clothing is often relegated to, to women. Um, it's always, you know, it's often called women's work. And even this existed even in the Shaker community. I, I, I find through my research that spinning, dyeing, weaving, knitting, sewing, mending, washing and ironing, that's so tedious that kind of work and and it's all essential to the shaker life and income um but it was typically completed by women uh and Lacey I'd like to ask you first uh how do you feel that this that this aligns with the the shaker ethos of gender equality in the outside world this work was often determined by um childbearing and and rearing but obviously that's not the case here. So why do you think that Shaker sisters were often doing this work that even in the outside world was considered women's work? Well, I think they were still very much of their time. Um, and, you know, I talk a lot about their, gen their gender equality, um, their views on gender equality uh, that, that really were quite radical for the time, but, you know, they still were of the time. There was still, as you point out, there was women's work and there was men's work. Um, the, the fact that they lived in these, these large communal settings um, allowed them to do this work on a scale that was not possible in a, um, in a, you know, like a farm household or something like that, where 
Um, there might be a few adult women or an adult woman and some teenage girls who are doing this kind of work just for the for the family. But I think it's interesting too that um, there are instances of crossover, sort of gender crossover in work that was getting done. Um, there's a photograph of one of the um, Camille laundries uh, that has a man working in the laundry. And um, there's certainly journal entries where if there was a you know hard rain coming or maybe there'd been a flood, the women would all get out into the fields and um, do what was otherwise thought of as, as men's work. So mm -hmm. it's not that they didn't cross over. And there was also um, in the 1920s and 1930s as the communities were in decline, uh, one of the last remaining chair workshops was actually run by a woman. Uh, there's these great photographs of, of her, you know, turning turning legs on a lathe uh, and keeping that industry going, which had, had historically been really a, the man's realm. Mm -hmm. But I think that also supports the idea of community, right? If someone needs help, it doesn't matter if it's work that you're really good at, you're gonna help out and and jump in whenever, whenever you're needed. No. And, um, I think maybe that's not something that would have existed outside of the Shaker community because you wouldn't you wouldn't need to be so collaborative to to succeed as a community. Whereas obviously in the, the Shakers did have to depend on one another. It was, you know, the the nearest community might be kind of far away. How are you going to ask for help when you need it? Um, and Emily, this sort of reminds me a little bit of of your work that uses textiles that were probably mostly originally created by women, whether they are, it's a pieced quilt or an embroidered tablecloth. And uh, I wanted to, to ask if you could speak to your desire to highlight the, the labor of, of women and, and women's work. And this maybe is a little speculative, but how do you think they'd feel if they knew that their, that their um, textiles had this second life? Yeah, so, well, to start, um, I, I've just always been drawn, I think, from a, a young age to the handcraft. And that's probably where it originates from. Of course, it is part of a larger concept now that it's female-centric techniques for menswear. And that definitely, you know, sets us apart in the market. But I, I think it's it's what drew me, you know, to these fabrications and this idea of the domestic space and of the home and of comfort and and so much of our foundation of the brand revolves around referencing these historical ideas of reuse and of self self sufficiency and of you know making something for the home that can be utilized you know whether it's using old scraps or whether it's creating the textile you know from or creating you know a homespun linen or something and. And for this second part of the question, how would they feel? I mean, we continue to get commissions from people whose grandparents, you know, made these items, whether they're handkerchiefs that would otherwise be discarded, you know, maybe they're kind of distressed or have cigarette marks. And when you put that much time and energy and effort into something, and if someone's going to take you know, originally, and if someone's going to take the time to then mend it and preserve it, I think that people would, I think these women would understand that. And, and they do understand that, that, oh gosh, I, I put so much time into this. And if there's a team of people that are going to continue to add on to it and to help preserve, you know, the pattern or the fabrication, um, I think all in all, it's, it's definitely something that would be positive. I think you're right. When you've put that much work into something, it, it's it's an honor that someone would want to keep using it um, well, you know, long after it's sort of um, been kind of, I don't know, pushed into a closet or, or boxed up and it's in an attic. And otherwise that might be a sort of a cradle to grave situation where it never never leaves that box without without someone looking at it and kind of with fresh eyes. Right. And I mean, we see so often, you know, when we go into people's homes or look through people's, um, you, I guess, like their trunks of their grandmother's items and or great grandparents. And they say, you know, for generations, these have been sitting here and I no longer want them. And, and for me, I feel like it's my duty to help explain that 
you know, you can make a, a pillow sham out of it, or you can make a shirt, or you can make something that is also timeless that you could pass on as an heirloom that has a, a really practical use instead of having a stack of them in a wooden trunk, you know, for a hundred years or something. Um, or we, you know, I can explain also, you know, how to wash it or frame it or use it in some way that doesn't involve cutting or changing the original um, intent of it. And um, I guess maybe the last thing that we could talk about or should talk about is, is, um, is this, this idea of beauty and utility. And maybe how do you feel that the, both your work, Emily, and also um, the kind of legacy of the Shakers concepts of, of finding beauty and utility and beauty in everyday practice and, and, and chores and also community time and time that you, that you spend um, singing and, and dancing and enjoying one another's company. Uh, what do you think we're facing? Do you, do you think that that's something that people are going to feel more um, excited about that they've, that they've been missing it? Or, or do you think that I guess, I guess, what do, you, what do you think for the future after this pandemic and after spending so much time in isolation, even if you're spending your time in isolation quilting and crafting, it's still by yourself and, and it's a different feeling for sure. Yeah, I, I think people, there of course is this return to craft, right? Um, that's happening quite a bit. And I think people are also, looking at their lives and what they're doing with their time and the objects that they're collecting in their home, there's a more intention, intentional uh, aspect to this. So people are really taking, <clears throat> taking time to understand what it is that they would like to curate or what it is that they would like to hold on to. And, for me, um, this is quite exciting because I've, I've loved the idea of having garments that you can pass on for generations and that you can mend and transform and that people are getting really excited about this and asking, oh, how do I darn my socks? Or, you know, how do I tailor my trousers? You know, can I do it myself? And, and it's really beautiful to see that happening. Uh, when I first started my brand, we, we had to tell, you know, teach everyone how to sew on a button. And I think it's, it's important that even, you know, our retail team knows how to put on a button and, and that's, that's happening more and more. I really, I see that, especially in the last year. And do you think that the, Lacey, do you, do you feel like the, the, it's not quite homesteading, but it's certainly spending time in, in your, your space and, and nurturing your space, whether it's planting a garden or um, really thinking critically about what do I need around me all the time? Do I need this thing? Do I need this book? Do you feel like that sort of shaker approach to life and, and really elevating utility? Do you, do you think that people are maybe moving more towards that than, than they have in the past? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think this is a period of time where we're all reevaluating what's actually important to us. Um, and it, it is clarity coming out of out of it. Um, uh, you know, what what do we really value? What do we need in our lives? Um, but it's um, it's something that I saw before the pandemic uh, and I think has has really come into even more focus um, in the last, you know, nine, 10 months. Uh, people have been very drawn to, to Shaker history and the Shaker ethos and the Shaker values and the community building. And I see that especially upstate in Columbia County, um, that there, there really is a, a generation of, of people who, who want to have a more direct experience with, with the things in their lives and, and materiality and the things that they're eating and the things that they're, they're using and they're um, you know, and just the the day to day functioning of uh, of their lives, and I, I think that um, that we were already moving towards a point where where those things were becoming more attractive to people, and I I think that this only this experience of being in isolation and away from our communities only um, only uh, strengthens that. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Well, do either of you have any any last thoughts on on Shaker Design, how it how it's kind of affecting your life personally or or your work? This this you know <laughs> design a little bit here. I'm not sure about design, but I I find it very um, hopeful and comforting to think about the fact that uh, there was this group of people who thrived for 150 years. Uh, in the United States who had such radical progressive um, values about how to live with each other. Um, I find that very, very inspiring. Yeah, and, and I find it inspiring um, how prolific they were, especially in the textile arts or in craft in general, you know, seeing how much it was documented as well, uh, even anonymously in letters or journals or but yeah, I think how prolific they were as a community of makers is really, really inspiring. Absolutely. Well, I hope it continues to inspire us yeah. <laughs> well into the future. Um, well, thank you so much, Lacey and Emily. And um, also thank you to the Shaker Museum and Design Miami. This has been great. Thank you. This is really fun. Yeah.